Hi everyone, welcome to the Super Gate. Hi. My name is Ken. I'm Emily. And today we're covering Broadchurch Series 3, Episode 5. Mm-hmm. I can't believe it's Episode 5 already. Yeah, I know. <laughs> It's crazy. And we, and we don't have a 10-episode season. I know. As it feels pretty standard with most TV shows, but... Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're on the, the back half here. Um, and th- this this one's definitely a doozy. Uh, yes. It's five pages of note-taking. Um, but before we get to the... Uh, you know, proper episode five discussion. I did want to read a little bit of episode four feedback. Yay! Courtesy of Delola. Yay! And you can always have your feedback featured right here at the beginning if you write in at seabrigadepodcast at gmail.com. Yes, please do. So Delola writes some comments on episode four. Uh-huh. I was glad to see Nige uh, show up <laughs> because Joe Sims, who plays him, has been hugely enthusiastic about the show and used to tweet to fans. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, he seems like a nice guy. Um, so, so, someone else people keep uh, clamoring about in the comment section is, um, oh, uh, the guy who plays Aaron Mayford because mm-hmm. he has a he apparently has a part in Peep Show. Yes. Yes. Of which I've only watched like the first three episodes, and they're fantastic. But they just, oh, uh, they, they, yeah, they. Olivia they, Coleman was also in Peep Show. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. In the very first, Sophie, yeah. In the very yeah, in the first episodes I watched, you're right, yeah. Oh, um, Jolola also writes uh, the guy playing the creepy rapist. Oh yeah, was on Peep Show with Olivia <laughs> Coleman. <laughs> there we go. Wow. He's known as a comic actor, not so much a dramatic one. Uh, I've heard huh. the same thing about the actress who's playing Trish. Really? Yeah. Huh. That's cool. There was some confusion about how old the Cappy's son is. Lindsay said Michael started the change when he turned 14, not that he was 14 right mm. then at that moment. She and Clive married 16 years ago when she got pregnant, so Michael has to be at least 15. And Tom mm. is 15. Mm. Uh, they write, Daisy is 17 or 18. Uh, Chris Tribnall has been stretching and contracting time in between the seasons. Uh, she was apparently 15 in Series 1 sometime in 2013, yeah. and st- still 15 in Series 2, yet she was the same age as Pippa, who was killed at 12 in 2012. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> they also wrote in some uh, notes about Hardy's date. I highly doubt it was a success. Uh, he didn't help move the seat uh, for Zoe as a gentleman would. He pointed the seat uh, to indicate she should sit like he was at work. Um, yeah, just like a whole bunch of notes about how like uh, he's you know, too stiff. But, he's useless at the dating thing. But uh, maybe the biggest uh, point here is that um, like it looked like the date ended early because he ran into Ellie and then they went to Jim's garage and Jim was still there. Yeah. Just a point. Uh, Jalila also writes, Some things I'm wondering. How did Soko Brian miss all the toys, the cricket bats, and, and the wheelbarrow when they first swept the ground? Brian. Uh, the, fir- the thing I thought was, like, we, we've been told this is a massive amount of space and mm-hmm. that they only have, you know, they're, they're going through it on foot. Mm-hmm. You know, so they don't, they're not bringing helicopters and drones to look, you know, for, for everything. The other note, I think Hardy has made two mistakes with evidence. Uh, mm-hmm. First, he should have taken the wheelbarrow since it might have been used to move Trish to the waterfall, um, which is which is a theory I heard. Um, um, second, he and Ellie should have taken the flowers from Trish to take it for Trace. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a question that, uh, or a point that I think moves into some theories. How did Jim afford such a lavish lavish party for Kath? Uh, yeah, is there a way that he made money for the party through dealing drugs or booze or something else? Mm. Oh, and yeah. of course, it's still weird that there are over 50 men and less than 30 women. Yeah. It's, Actually, it's... Um, you know, after hearing Jalola's points, I it kind of makes me think of... We, the cricket bat didn't come back this week at all, right? Right. And um, oh, what was the other thing? Oh, I don't remember. But just it feels like certain things we've kind of... I've, I've forgotten about them, and then we, they still haven't been resolved. So we still have... Like, even, like, the toys in the wheelbarrow and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. They haven't really come back at all. Yeah, um, three episodes is still a lot of time yeah. for no, all this, this is stuff. True. This is yeah. true. Oh, but you know, let's dive into this episode. Yeah, yeah. let's do yeah. it. Thanks, Jalila. Yes, thank you. So uh, we pick up 
uh, from where, where we left off last week with the victim from uh, Cooper's Tell Marketing telling mm-hmm. their story to Alec mm-hmm. Nelly. Uh, yeah. Her name is Laura Benson, mm-hmm. who was raped after leaving the Rising Sun pub in Abbott's Chapel. Uh, she describes it being, you know, there being like live music at the pub, um, which could, I think, implicate the musicians. Mm. At least gives us that. Hmm. Uh, she was gagged with a thick material and remembers the smell of cheap spirits, um, which makes me think it's someone who's not paying much for the booze. Yeah. And on that note, I was also thinking if Trish smelled vodka, you know, I, I, vodka, cheap spirits that could be around the same mm. neighborhood. So, mm. like, did she spe- did she specify vodka? Trish specified vodka. Okay. Laura specified cheap spirits. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which doesn't seem like the type of thing they would be serving at the party. Yeah. Anyway, if if only those two things matched, then I would say like, oh, it definitely wasn't someone at the party where they had tequila and champagne mm. and stuff like that. You know, why would you be drinking you know bum wine? Um, <laughs> which oh man, um, I I could use some UK bum wine <laughs> suggestions. <laughs> In the email section. Anyways. Uh, she also mentioned that the clothes from that night were washed and then never worn again. Um, yeah. And also Laura, uh, she never came in to the police or because she was basically afraid of slut shaming. You know, the way mm-hmm. you treat a woman who is drunk and in a short skirt and makeup right. and stuff like that. But now she's coming in because she feels guilty that, you know, it's potentially her attacker striking again. Um and I think also her coming in via, vis-a-vis the seeing the Broad Church Echo uh, headline that uh, basically to me at least fulfills Maggie's part in season three. Yeah, that we do we do see her again, but like okay, the Broad Church Echo has served its purpose and its dying gasps, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I I think that we could have served that purpose without having Maggie's in in there, but yeah, you know. Yeah, well, you gotta you gotta fill six hours of. Eight hours of TV. Yeah. Understood. Uh, so they drop Laura off at her house, and she mentions, she mentions that she got married six weeks ago, um, and her husband doesn't know. And we kind of leave. You know, and I, I don't know if that's ever going to come up again, but I thought I would um, leave that note in there, just because any character that gets mentioned that we don't see, I'm like, I don't know, maybe that will come up again. But uh, on the whole, I just like this whole Laura character. And aside from having the yeah. strength to come, to come back, there's something about... Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think she's been a good example so far of how she's not a character who we expected to be in this season because she wasn't in... You, normally, I think for yes. Broad Church, they, they kind of lay it all out on the table right away, whereas I feel like in this season, it's kind of been more coming out. People, we've, we've met more people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think season one did that as well, and I guess season two, but mm. I think that this season's kind of been doing it more, and it feels more effective. Like, we're not just adding people for the sake of adding people. Yeah, I mean, if I can go on a slight tangent, um, I have a friend who just watched um, Broad Church season one last night, and se- or episode one last night and episode two oh. like, just now. Uh, and she wrote, like, oh my gosh, the end of episode two, I can't believe it. And I had to go back and look, and I think the episode ends with them finding Mark Latimer's fingerprints in the murder hut. Oh, the, the murder the cliff hut. Cabin, yeah. The cliff cabin. Yeah. Um, yeah. And but the way I the way I pitched it to her was like you know the the, the very beginning of season one is almost like a play, mm-hmm. where yeah. it, like the camera pans and you see the entire cast of characters the same way like in an opening musical number, everyone you meet is basically introduced to you in the opening musical number, you know. Yeah. And, but, it, you know, which which is really cute in, episode, in in the first series, but I don't know that you can keep doing it, you know, without it yeah. feeling really contrived to be like, why, why, why you know, at, at this point, like the, the farm and the mm-hmm. net shop and the taxi driver, these are all things that are just too far. They feel geographically far away from one another in a way. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. As the show expands its horizons, it has to do this like unraveling of information. Yeah. Although something I think that it's still kind of doing is maybe less so, but I was thinking less so, but then you kind of just described Clive as the taxi driver and then um, what's his name? I don't know, Leo as Leo. The, yeah. the fisherman guy. So in season one, too, it also kind of is like 
it kind of feels like a game of clue of like was it the priest was it the dad was it the mom was it like you know everyone's very tied to like their jobs and mm-hmm. so i was gonna say i was gonna say maybe they don't do it that much anymore but i think they still kind of do yeah. like the peripheral characters yeah, well, you're only, you're only gonna meet the mechanic. Like, you're yeah. only gonna meet like one of each um, job. Right. We don't have we don't have there's, uh, there's, three taxi drivers. Yeah, there's one taxi driver, two plumbers. Uh, you know, I, I it, it's good though. I mean, it's it's good show writing because we're not getting like mm-hmm. too caught up. Mm-hmm. You know, it, if you can't remember Leo's girlfriend's name, you can remember she worked at the ice cream shack or something. <laughs> and so. she will go to jail if she's lying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah alec is like struggling slash you know upset with society because like i can't believe she didn't come in because she was you know afraid of being you know not treated respectfully and, yeah uh, just... i think it's kind of interesting to see alec have these moral crises mm-hmm. where he's just really let down by humanity morally and I, I, he doesn't really seem to he's very rarely do we see him kind of confront and kind of try to deal with these moral conundrums because he he likes to pretend like he's somebody who's to the point based on the facts based on the case whereas now it seems like he's really kind of caught up and especially we'll talk about that later with daisy like he's kind of caught up in society's failings Mm -hmm. yeah and uh you know in three episodes time i hope that comes to some kind of optimistic point yeah, I hope so too. Yeah, I could kind of see it being like I hope that he gets some sort of optimistic Ending. point to leave on because it kind of reminds me of how um, you remember in um, I don't know if our listeners have seen True Detective season one, but like at the end yeah. you have you know you have Rust Cole who like the whole time has been like spewing this kind of nihilistic garbage, and then kind of at the end you realize he has the oh I don't want to spoil it. Can I spoil it? It's been so many years. Let's <laughs> <laughs> like skip a minute forward. Yeah, sure. If you plan on watching True Detective Season 1 and you haven't yet. But yeah, so he, he kind of, at the end, after the near-death experience, and he um, he kind of feels love, he feels his daughter, he feels his father, and then he comes to like, this very happy ending. And you sort of realize that all of like the nihilism has just been kind of a cover-up for a guy who feels too deeply, but he pretends like he doesn't feel anything. And I think that Hardy is kind of like that, too. Or he likes to pretend like he doesn't feel anything, but in reality, he feels stuff really, really deeply. Yeah, I'll just say, like, I... I'm predicting the type of ending for everyone, but um, not yeah. without not without a little bit of um, episode six and episode seven um, struggle. Uh, th- things will get harder before they get better. I think that personally, other than well, um, Hardy, this episode has the personal struggle with his daughter, and Ellie's been kind of struggling with Tom. Although Tom's been kind of mercifully absent, which is okay yeah. with me. Yeah. Um, but I think in season one and season two, they def- they had bigger moral um, conflicts to deal with, I think. Mm-hmm. Whereas in this season, like even Alex's health now is no longer a plot point, which is good. You know, that was kind of played out. But he's it used to be like kind of he was waffling between life and death. I, w- I was just thinking um, Tom is a teenage boy who has been uh, left at home by himself. Yeah. For, for quite a number of hours, so he's having a grand, <laughs> he's having a grand whole time. So, Tom is very happy. Yeah. Uh, so what happens next is Trish sets up a meet with Jim, uh, where they discuss you know coming clean to Kath, mm-hmm. and uh, it, you know at first Jim, I, I, Jim Reeves is being very self interested. Mm-hmm. Oh, we shouldn't tell Kath. You don't know what you're getting into, mm-hmm. and. Maybe he he knew better than we thought because of the way Kath um, develops in the future. It's like, oh, maybe he just knew he was married to someone a little bit crazier than we all thought. <laughs> but we'll, yeah. we'll get to that. Um, DC Katie connects Aaron Mayford to Trish and Laura through the IT company he used to work for. Yeah, I think that Katie is Katie has had a good episode. Yeah, and we, we've always been like pretty like pro. Katie. It's not pro Katie. We've been like you know Katie's okay. We haven't we yeah. haven't we like Katie and we have some people have not liked Katie, but I think that after this episode, Katie is definitely cool. I think. Mm-hmm. And Alec and Ellie are kind of like cool with Katie. Yeah, it goes yeah. both ways. This episode. Yes, everyone's growing, and yeah. you know, 
I, we like it. We like it, I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, so Aaron Mayford used to work for this IT company, which had contracts with the Flintcomb Farm Shop and Cooper's Tell Marketing, which is where Laura works. Mm-hmm. Uh, Katie, uh, maybe looking for some re- revenge, does the door knocking at Aaron's house. And when he refuses to come for questioning, Katie arrests him. And that's pretty nice. Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty. It's a really gratifying scene, mm-hmm. you know, as as a fellow woman to watch and to see somebody who's just been a, such a slime ball to you, and to really get that gratification. I was like, "You go, Katie. You go." Mm-hmm. And like the nod when Ellie's like, "Yeah, you cuff him," and she cuffs him. <laughs> <laughs> so before Aaron's interview, I, I wanted to run this by you because um, I, I wasn't going to rewatch it on ITV because it just takes so much time to scrub through an episode. But before the interview, we got a shot of fishermen on the beach. Did one of them yeah. look like that was definitively Aaron to you? I don't know what that was supposed to be. Because it was definitely, like, during the day. And there was some guy who was, like, very beardy. Yeah. That we that we kind of focus on. But I don't know if that was him. I, I, I was a little confused by that scene. Yeah, well, it looked like it was, like, it could have been, like, the crack of dawn. Like, people who were out at, like, 4 or 5 a.m. Or maybe 5 a.m. And I I thought, oh, that's Aaron. And they did that transition from beardy guy fishing to him to maybe confirm that he was not lying about fishing, but lying about something else. I don't know. Mm. But, I mean, it doesn't really matter too much because he does implicate himself uh, with some lies. Um, and during that interview, Alec lays out some brilliant traps. Like, oh, hey, yeah, so you went fishing uh, and you, to get to the beach, you drove down these roads, right? Mm-hmm. So, yes, I did. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Which, I mean, that's, that's, kind of, yeah. that's kind of crazy that, like, CCTV is that, like, like yeah, we know you lied about that. Because in America, we, I mean, I guess we have traffic cams, but not, like, that's only if you run a light or something, they'll catch you. Yeah, well, traffic cams, traffic cams on one end, right? But then also, like, um... Like, you might collect CCTV from, like, you know, gas stations along the way. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, and, and he kind of, he it, it's it's funny, though, because, like, um, like, hypothetically, if this was your first season of Broadchurch, you, you'd be wondering, like, what the hell is, what, what, why is he asking all these questions? This is a waste of everyone's time. But, he, but these questions are Alex's way of, like, you're going to, you're going to fuck up. When I, mm-hmm. when I when I ask you about these specifics, when I, when I say, what did you catch? And you tell me a dozen mackerel, and you tell me you <laughs> ate six for dinner, I'm going to ask, so we're, we're going to find six mackerel in your freezer? <laughs> like, I don't know. I, uh, I, I liked the scene, but I, all the while, I'm like, eh, he's not going to, like, um, this isn't, this is the, this is the small fry. Uh, like, literally. <laughs> so the, the big stuff I think from this interview is that Aaron used to have a friend called Dave King um, from Kings Bear, which is where Laura lives. Yeah, and the two may have drank at the Rising Sun pub before. Uh, the two of them fell out of touch when Aaron got arrested for rape, uh, and they used to play football together, uh, which. I think will pr- prove relevant and yes. actually and somewhat tragically yeah. prison kills your social life. Yeah. Um, also like the fact that football um, and like the number of players, who, the number of people in town who play football, while not strange for England, I'm sure. Um, I'm like, Oh, th- th- this might actually resolve the whole footy match they had on the beach where it's like, Oh, this was a sign that so-and-so played football and so-and-so played football and that, you know, maybe they know. knew this, maybe they knew this Dave King guy who was, you know, best friend of Aaron the rapist. So <laughs> Aaron the rapist. Yeah. Uh, so they they ask him about doing IT for the farm shop and Cooper's telemarketing. Uh, Aaron kind of glosses right over doing the IT for Flint, for Flintcomb, but the, I think the questioning gets more intense when they talk about Laura. Mm-hmm. So they bring up his name. They bring up her name like three times, and they kind of do like a zoom in on his face. And you know, I don't think it's necessarily like, oh yeah, he he was the one who raped her. But maybe he's thinking like, oh, 
shoot, like maybe I mentioned her to my friend Dave or something like that. Like maybe he's like in the back of his head thinking like, no, I, I've never met her, but I know who you're talking about. I don't know. That was just a thought. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, what happens next is at Trisha's house, uh, she comes clean about having sex with Jim uh, to Kath, and Kath gets really, really brutal. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty rough. Uh, he, she says, oh, his standards have, like, how his standards have slipped. Mm-hmm. One. Two. Like, oh, where'd you have sex? Right here in my house. I never knew the smell of mildew turned him on. Aw. And, and then, yeah. And then finally, what I don't get is, why would anyone rape you? Doesn't make sense. It's, yeah, that, that was that was rough. Yeah. The the one the one thing point that mm-hmm. where I understood Catherine because um obviously Trish kept saying I'm sorry I'm sorry and she's mm-hmm. like well if you're sorry you wouldn't have done it right and I I it's kind of like I mean I think that Trish is genuinely sorry that it happened but it's also like you know those people who just always like chronically apologize like I'm sorry I'm sorry like no you're not actually sorry mm-hmm. so I understood that anger but the rest of it was like whoa that is the other angle that I is liked, a lot the other angle I liked from Kath was when she asked so do you love him mm, and Trish's yeah. like no are you daft and she's yeah like, I was like oh, I'm like, sorry mm. Trish I'm just you know the one who married him right yeah so I think it's like a lot of I mean Trish wasn't thinking whereas Kath I think is very very like she's cruel and she she knows it Mm -hmm. which also shows I mean that she is capable of this cruelty however does that then I mean is she was this shock genuine because if it was genuine then that kind of eliminates her possibly from helping to being an accomplice of some sort yeah I think I on on some level, the, the calf being the plant, like being like or, orchestrating a revenge rape, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that theory takes a hit this week. Mm-hmm. Um, not that calf isn't manipulating. Um, some speculate that the reason she told Ed about the affair later in the episode was just so Ed would go beat up Jim. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's. A reasonable pretty reasonable theory. yeah because yeah, i don't think she particularly cares for ed it's not like she's gonna confide in him right so i'm trying to think where were we oh yeah for kath so yeah. she, she then calls jim who tries to apologize and then she, she's like ah oh, do you know what your weakness is you're stupid but you think you're smart that's a very <laughs> dangerous place to to live i can set fire to your life whenever i choose and uh, she, yeah, she she kind of plays a, a little Cersei Lannister here. She, yeah. Um, <laughs> Is Kath the Cersei of Broadchurch? Kind of, for <laughs> sure. Um, the, honest, honestly, there was a part of me that when when Jim's truck broke down later in the episode, I thought it was because Kath did something to the truck. She like cut a wire. <laughs> no, it was going to explode or something. Like uh, I. You know, I, I I got so wrapped up, I think, in, in last week's theory <laughs> that I I maybe thought Kath was um, a stronger manipulator or downright like cartoonish villain than <laughs> she really is. When she she might herself just be the victim of like an idealistic or a, a woman who thinks marriage is this great thing and then ending up in a loveless marriage mm-hmm. and the effects that causes. So, yeah. In the next scene, uh, Beth is in a meeting with her supervisor, uh, Sahana. I had to get that name from IMDb because even even Alec and Beth just refer to her. Oh, Alec and Ellie just refer to her as Beth's boss. And um, yeah. I think, okay. uh, yeah, I think this actress was like good. So I like, yeah, I liked her. Yeah. So she's telling Sahana about uh, the details of Trisha's attack. And like, oh, yeah, it was really brutal to be in the same room where she was describing how she was gagged and, bo- and bound and da 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 and she and her boss is like oh uh yeah that's totally normal to feel disturbed by the way um <laughs> can you repeat that so um before you even really know what happens you're like oh shit like this is sparking some kind of memory and yeah well at first i thought it was gonna be her own experience right. then yeah it makes it look she it makes more like oh she's at she works at a crisis center yeah or something obviously like that. yeah 
Um, so yeah, they immediately basically go to um, Alec and Ellie, and uh, you know, because of confidentiality rules, they can't say who the victim was, but they say a client eleven months ago had a story that was very similar to Trish and Laura's. Um, right. So now we have Laura was two years ago. Laura was two years ago, and then this was more it's still like eleven months, 11 and months. then Trish. Right. Um. Yeah, but the the difference, the, I guess the 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 key fact out of this one was that the victim, in in this case, eleven months ago, specifically remembered being gagged with a sock. Yeah. Um, which gives us reason to start looking for a sock. Which yes, is and it also, in Alex's mind at least, eliminates Aaron the rapist it's because Aaron would have been in prison. Yes. Now Katie is not entirely convinced. Ellie seems like. <laughs> you know, not strongly for it, but not also not like you know vehemently opposed to it either, like Katie is. So I think Alec is trying to run with the theory that this is all the same person. Yes. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Well, it's funny that you say that because my 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 next point here was that Alec, Ellie, and Katie sound like our Reddit episode discussion. Because <laughs> <laughs> Alec is like. Okay, we can rule Aaron, so that means we have, like, a serial rapist who's been operating for two years un- unnoticed. And then it's the, the, it just evolves. Unless we have two rapists. Or three rapists. And it's just like, <laughs> ah! How are you supposed to work like that? Yeah, um, it's like, I mean, Ellie, Ellie is someone who's like, doesn't want to discount anybody. Alec wants to discount everybody possible. And then Katie is someone who, in the back who's kind of just like, well, maybe we should focus on this person specifically. Right. Well, and here, if if there's anything wrong, yeah, like you, you kind of nailed it on the on the spectrum. Katie, having had a negative experience with Aaron, mm-hmm. is like leaning too heavily on like I think Aaron's the guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, she's definitely biased in that way, but I also understand. Right, I understand yeah. her. Uh, yeah, and I'm and, and no, I'm glad no one's like dunking on Katie for suggesting mm-hmm. it's Aaron because as as Ellie says, there's something not right about Aaron. And, oh, yeah, he's and, and, creepy. And, and as Alex says, oh, listen, we're all agreed on that. <laughs> the time's <laughs> running out here. So they release Aaron on bail as Ellie and Katie look on. And that really does feel like um, the moment neither of them are going to look, you know. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they'll be besties up until the, it's revealed to them how whatever it is Katie did with Ed Burnett instead of coming clean yeah. about the fact that she's related to Ed Burnett. So Yeah, because that still has not happened yet. Yeah. That, yeah, I mean, that's going to be a big blow to Katie's character as well, just because she's somebody who I think likes to present the persona that she's... She kind of views Allie and Alec. Allie and Alec, wow. That was good. <laughs> Ellie and Alec. Yeah. As, um, like, she likes to call them out on their flaws, but she has a major, major one in her closet that has not come to light yet, and it's just bound to come to light. Yeah, and we might have to imminently. We might have to shatter the Katie fan club after that, depending <laughs> depending on how severe her um, involvement mm-hmm. is. But right, I mean, influencing Ed's alibi. Right. That I mean, could, truthfully, yeah. I don't think that Ed was involved. I, I, for me, currently, I don't think that he was involved in the crime, mm-hmm. but I don't know. Right. If he doesn't tell the whole truth about the situation, it could severely impact yeah. the way this whole thing goes down. Right. I mean, even if he's not, even if he's not at fault, if he's withholding some sort of information that he doesn't necessarily know will propel the case forward, that that could be a huge thing. Mm-hmm. Uh. Also. Okay. Well, speaking of Ed. Um. Ian comes to Ed to rent a caravan for a few weeks, <laughs> and Ed just dunks on him. Yeah, and, I kind of love that everybody hates Ian because he, he sucks. <laughs> yes. He really sucks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I seen on the cake. I'd love a scene where some students just dunk on him. But all right, yeah. Uh, and so Ed, <laughs> sort of Ed is just like, "Shit, you had it all: uh, a good home, a lovely wife, and you blew it all." And, oh no! Cherry on top. I'm not giving you a caravan because I don't trust you. Uh, your wife didn't trust you, and I wouldn't be surprised if you were the rapist. And Ian just Boom. looks. Ian just looks like oh, what? <laughs> like like the, this dork. Uh, I, yeah, he sucks. Yeah, Ian sucks. 
<laughs> and he's going to throw the whole episode off next week, for sure. Yeah. And next week's going to be an Ian episode. Yeah, because it's... We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. That's my last we'll point. We'll get to that. <laughs> uh, Beth and Paul meet at the playground. Uh, mm-hmm. Paul has asked Beth to uh, set up a meet with Trish. Um you know, on some hand, feels selfish, but I also really feel for Paul. Yeah, Reddit thinks that this is very suspicious. Yeah, well, I, di- I didn't read it as such. I read it as like, um, and, and he makes it kind of clear. Paul is envious of Beth because it's her line of work to help people. Um, right. And for Paul, that might have been what he signed up for, was helping people. But, you know... And in some level, Trish represents a growing non-religious population Right. that even though Trish has gone through something traumatic and Paul is like, I'm here if you need help, uh, de- depending on what type of non-religious person you are, uh, your views on on Paul or in his established religion or, you know, the, the church, your views can range from animosity to apathy. Like you might either mm-hmm. hate Paul for being mm-hmm. a priest or just be like, I just, no, you, you might feel awkward. Like, I don't have anything to talk to you about. And right. And I think also too, you know, it, the advantages of the reasons why Trish really likes confiding in Beth and trusts Beth and that kind of thing. I think a, it's the woman to woman connection and B it's also that she knows that Beth has experienced a severe tragedy and she understands Although not the specific situation, she understands this life-altering situation and how you deal with it and you move, you move on and also move upwards. And yeah. I don't know that people view Paul as having that same sort of thing. It's not as genuine. It's more manufactured. Yeah, well, I, I, and I was going to say, I Arthur Darville really sells the whole character mm-hmm. where it's like i don't think i i mean like well i was gonna say like i never liked the priest character so much but it's not true there are actually tons of awesome priest characters on tv i guess but um he just sells me on a character that um you know obviously some people are reading as suspicious or selfish yeah. and I'm like, I'm like i just feel bad for him <laughs> yeah well i mean so far he's because i mean in season one he was obviously someone who was on the suspect list and that kind of thing. We found out that he was, he's an alcoholic. Um, we found out, I mean, obviously there's just always like the, kind of like the priest trope of like yeah. creepy priests, but he's subverted it so far. And it's all, you know, he's kind of, it feels like a lot of the reason why he's in the situation he's in right now is because he was like, he believed too much in the capacity to repent and to change. And he went and spoke with Joe Miller at length. And, Obviously, a word about that got out, and I think that that's also part of the reason why people are not, you know, flocking to him. Mm-hmm. I, uh, well, the next point goes on that, the, the idea of repent, or, you know, or saving people. Because Paul's afraid Mark has gone on his murder field trip to Liverpool. And, <laughs> murder field trip. Yeah, and and Beth and Beth has just kind of let it go. Like, yeah. look, you can't rescue someone who doesn't want to be saved. Yeah, and I, I really, I respect that position, too, mm-hmm. where she, she's not hung up on it. She's like, he's going to do what he's going to do, and I'm not involved. And I have bigger things to worry about than my dopey ex-husband doing stupid things. So, I mean, okay, theory here. Um, I've always thought, you, you know how there was, a, there was a moment at the end of, the, at the end of season one where Joe wanted to like, talk things out with Mark a little bit mm-hmm. or explain things out? Mm-hmm. I really hope the the twist here is that this murder field trip turns into like a feels field trip where he finally just gets to talk to the guy who killed his son and like tries to f- learn something about it or come to peace that way. And then maybe the thing that brightens up Paul's whole w- world outlook is that Mark comes back from murder field trip having not murdered anyone. And he's like, oh, people can fix themselves and I don't have to like you know I don't have to go out of my way to like get that involved or something like that maybe that's Paul's happy ending because I don't I think I think also that you know because Paul did 
has spent lots of time counseling Mark and telling yeah. him that this he, this is what he needs to do. And if Mark actually is able to do it, which, I mean, I don't necessarily trust that he can, but right. if he is able to do it, then that's got to be something huge for Paul, I would think. And I was just thinking it would also make me happy if if that was Mark's trajectory. It was like, mm-hmm. oh, I I don't have to just murder people. <laughs> Yeah. Or, or, or don't need, or, or I don't need, I don't need revenge. That's not my, that's not my arc. I don't know. But. I don't know. I could see it going one of both ways, though, because it, it he could either he could get that like somewhat redemptive ending, or he could get the some sort of really really terrible ending of yeah, uh, grief consuming you. Yeah, I, I, and I think him being consumed is just as realistic as being yeah. redeemed. It's just a, it's just a matter of what kind of story they're trying to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if I had to guess, I feel like on the whole, things in Broadchurch feel more optimistic than pessimistic. Like even, I think so. Like, even in season two, when the case doesn't go their way, the town still bands together to kick Joe out. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I'm just thinking, before Mark goes on that field trip, uh, there's a scene with him and Maggie, where Maggie gives him some letters. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that then was kind of weird. And then he's on his way, and I just wrote down what was that like i'm like are the letters from joe to maggie um or like okay what are the letters are they things well, they who, said danny on them are, yeah are they th- are they letters for danny sent or sent to danny or about the book maybe like comments about how the book i, I don't know um, my guess was that it was some sort of cause i don't mark latimer doesn't seem like the letter writing type mm-hmm. but i could see it being I didn't even think that they would be possibly from Joe to Danny, which I don't know that they were, just because that would leave a paper trail. Well, Dan, I was thinking, Danny used to deliver the paper, right? That was, like, one of his yeah, side jobs. Yeah, So yeah. maybe she would still have letters around? Yeah, like, I was thinking it could have been, like, a like a writing exercise where, like, mm-hmm. Maggie was, like, you know, write some letters to Danny and tell him, like, what you want to know and that kind of thing. I don't know. <sighs> I mean, so yeah, I was like, I, I don't know this. I yeah, don't know. not I, entirely I, clear. Yeah, I'm like, I don't know about this scene. <laughs> yeah, and is that also? Are we taking that as Maggie's exit from the series? Uh, I, I, I don't know about that either. Um, yeah, I mean, we hadn't seen her in a few episodes, and I would kind of be okay if that was the well, end, just because like, I haven't really seen a, a, like she just says, a like, compelling take care. purpose. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. If, if, if that's her last scene, like, take care. I know what you're doing. I don't know. I wouldn't be into it. I, yeah. I mean, I would be happier if she just didn't appear in that scene at all. And that and that her last, her last acts of, you know, influence on the show were off camera writing the newspaper. You know? Mm-hmm. Like... True. Like, if the Broadchurch Echo had, like, two more headlines that influenced the story somehow, I'm like, that's it. You don't need to be on screen doing it. You're, we know you're writing the headlines, so. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so that's just a theory. Um, oh, yeah, so up next at the uh, Little Fish and Ships shack, Alec and Ellie interview Danielle, who is Leo's alibi. Um, and it starts with, uh, like, oh, we're not here after ice cream. And then Ellie's like, speak for yourself. <laughs> it's a very small little line. Oh, and if I may, um, if you go on Google Maps and zoom in on West Bay, mm-hmm. uh, there's a section that is just marked fish and chips, which is a little bit inact because there are like six little fish and chips shacks. Mm-hmm. And that is one of them. So that's uh. shot, the shot that's shot in West Bay. And I didn't eat at that one. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, loser. Yeah, I, I I ate at the green one. There's like two green ones and like three blue <laughs> ones, but Aww. yeah, it's cute. Uh, but I you know what about the scene. Uh, here's what I have written down my notes. <clears throat> I'm not writing down her story because we know Leo made it all up, which saved me a yeah. lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> we can completely disregard it. Yeah. Um. The only thing I would say, there, I mean, maybe it's just consistent uh, world building, but she does, in her alibi, she says, like, oh, yeah, me and uh, Leo were at the Anglers, which must be a bar in Flintcomb or something, because 
the Anglers is the same bar that Jim met the band he hired for the birthday at. Uh. But I don't know. I I I I, try, I I always hope that when like oh okay that that bar got mentioned twice in five episodes maybe it might mean something. Um, here's hoping, plain detective. Uh, but yeah, so Alec and Ellie don't believe a word that comes out of Danny's mouth, and Alec says, "I'm sick. I'm getting sick of people lying to us." Um, and on some level, I wonder if the show watchers aren't too, or are we are we just like accustomed to like ah, oh, we know everyone's bullshit. Uh, yeah Uh, so Clive (laughs) leaves home abruptly even after Lindsay cooked dinner that was sad yeah it's just everything about that is sad Um, something I I thought about afterwards though was um, he goes to drive Leo and I wonder if maybe Leo has dirt on him like did did Clive leave abruptly because he's just an asshole who doesn't care about his family or did he leave abruptly because like he's the Mm. driver for leo because maybe leo has some kind of dirt on him or something i don't know this is true i don't know it's just an idea um alec arrives at home abruptly and catches chloe and daisy together Mm -hmm. uh and here daisy comes clean about um someone stealing her phone and um sharing nudes or maybe yeah. just maybe even just one photo. It sounds like, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's a bummer. Um, yeah. Not, yeah. Not only for not only for Daisy and Alec feeling like a failed father, but I think I might have said in like episode one and episode even maybe two or three that I liked that Daisy was just hanging out with some boys. And then, yeah, and like, oh, these guys seem all right. And it's like, well, oh. right, we thought that it could potentially be a positive thing. I'm like, oh yeah, like girls can hang out with boys and not necessarily have it be this. And then I was like, no, these boys are assholes. These are these are horny harassing. teenagers. Yes, and they're <laughs> awful, and they're everything that Alex suspected them to be. They're no good. No, I don't know. So, <sighs> so yeah, I mean, Alec promised that things would be different in Broadchurch, but here. Um, they're only worse. He, he appears, you know, it, so it, which to me reads like he gets more involved in the Broadchurch cases than he did at Sandbrook, and that here yeah. he's he's even you know at, he's away from home even more than he used to be. Yeah, and plus I think he's he's making them. He thinks that by pouring his life into this case, he's keeping he's helping Daisy and keeping her safe. And on one hand, yes, that's true. But on the other hand, she has actual. Like tangible issues going on in her life right now that he hasn't been accessible to her to learn about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, every, everything everything in this seems a bummer, and I I hope all the best for Daisy. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I think that Daisy is already on the right track, though. In yeah. that Chloe is on her side. Yes, yeah, and at, at some point. You might hope this turns into like the boys get expelled or something like that. Yeah, that'd maybe be pretty cool. maybe everyone gets expelled, right? Because whenever that happened in real life, it always seems like everyone gets like expelled. The person yeah. who took the photo gets expelled, and um, maybe and sometimes even gets like a worse punishment than the people who share it. But, yeah. Well, now the question is: Does is Tom at all a part of this? Um, I, I, I think it's too, the, the two, the things are too close to not be connected somehow. Um, and I, I think Alec and Ellie will be forced to confront each other as like failed parents, mm-hmm. not, not, not failed parents, but you can totally see how the two of them could get into an argument about like, how could your son share these pictures? How can your daughter take these pictures? And it it being like a a sad scene for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I mean, Tom was watching videos, and I, I wonder if that still won't turn into a plot point. I don't know. Well, now we're getting back to. I'm gonna guess we're gonna get more into the computer stuff next week with Ian. Right. Yeah. Um. 
we'll get to we'll get to the computer in a sec. The uh, the, the next thing I had down here, um, I started to repair. I, I started to write down Jim's Lori, and then I'm like, if I can't use Lori in a sentence, I'm not going to write it down here. <laughs> so I just wrote <laughs> Jim's repair truck breaks breaks down in the middle of the street, <laughs> and really, that's the end of that. It was like a isolated scene. Then. Ed gets caught in like a no good deed goes unpunished scenario where he sees that Kath is upset. He gets her um, a cup of joe or a cup of tea or something, and he she just kind of traps him in like this. Ed, am I attractive? Ed, would you have sex with me? It's just like, and I I feel for Ed for being in like this. <laughs> this yeah, like ooh, like what do I? Yeah, and he he just says the old like you know. In America, in America, we call it like the Title IX thing of like, yeah, I, yeah, I can't say anything as your boss. And then, and then he, when he does give answers, like, uh, probably, <laughs> it's it's not helpful either. There's no good way to answer the question. But maybe the whole point of this conversation is when Kath breaks it to Ed that Trish slept with Jim, and he gets a really like you know upsetting reaction to that. Yeah, which. It rules out, I guess, all the theories that, like, that's what they fought about at the party. Because apparently they didn't know. Or, and then, right. And, and then I think Kath gives another a line that adds some sympathy to her plot. Which is, she says, like, I just thought my life would be that I would love someone and they'd love me back. And it's like, yeah. I, I, it's like, I feel for Kath's character. But she yeah. also said some pretty harsh fucking things to a rape victim. So. Right, yeah. She's definitely, uh, I believe the term would be problematic. Yeah. And especially if, like we covered before, she tells this to Ed just to incite violence on on Jim. So. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Jim, uh, Clive picks him up and immediately starts talking about the rape at his party, even though Jim wants no part of that. Um, Mm -hmm. And Clive's like, oh yeah, well, really sucks, right? Because the rapist must have been someone you invited. But, I mean, Clive's very existence, as Jim points out, proves that that that's not true, since Clive was there and uninvited. Um, Also, Clive's, Clive's insistence that it must have been someone they invited was something that has been repeated over and over again, like the last four episodes, both by Kath and Jim. And like, everyone keeps saying like, Oh man, it must've been someone invited, um, which is really making me feel like that's not, we're getting cl- closer and closer to the apex of this is, which is maybe it's someone who wasn't invited. Yeah. I mean, right now of the characters we know who were not invited, but we're still near the party. That would be Clive. But even still, is that too? Because I, I, it's hard to know if we're supposed to be interpreting this. And in, I think I talked about this last week. But whereas last season one, it was all the characters were there, but Joe Miller, Joe Miller was there, but never a suspect, and always just kind of tangentially there. Yeah. Whereas then in season two with the Sandberg case, we knew who all the players were. It was just how did they all fit into the particular events? So is this going to be more of like? Somebody we don't we know but isn't up front is going to be the perpetrator, or is it going to be how are these people who we all know already and we've known for a while? How do they all fit into this? Yeah, well, I, I think something like they've interviewed everyone, but not everyone's been on the map. That makes sense. Like we've interviewed the musicians and we've interviewed catering. And we've interviewed Clive. We've interviewed people that weren't invited to the party, but were at the party. Mm-hmm. But they'd never really been treated like full characters. Like, the musician that they talked to didn't wasn't given an in-show name. And um, even, even catering, catering has a name in IMDb, but it was never named. So... I'm like I feel. Yeah. Like, I feel like we're retur- we're going to return to those characters in the final three episodes here. True, uh. but will it kind of feel? If it's the caterers and the musicians, I feel like they'd have to be tied in in a really compelling way for it not to be kind of like, well, why did we waste all these our time with these people? Well, because because I, I think it still might be connected in other ways. Uh, yeah. 
I, I guess I don't really have good theories beyond listing those, but we'll cover that in like a theory section at the very end. Mm-hmm. We're, so, we're so close to the end of the episode now. Um, Clive also mentions that he saw an interaction between Trish and Jim that so far nobody has mentioned yet. Like five episodes in, nobody has mentioned that like Jim and Trish were outside talking. Oh, or or yeah. as, as Clive says it, looked a little bit more than it was just talking. Um, so I wonder if that matters at all. And then after that, Jim makes Clive pull the cab over. And he's like, do you know who you're talking to? Like, do you know how many people I know? Like, I can make your life miserable. And I'm, and the thing I was wondering is, because Kath kind of fucks with me a little bit. Because Kath says, like, oh, yeah, Jim's dumb. He's dumber than, and he, he's dumb and he thinks he's smart. Mm-hmm. So is this an empty threat? Or is this connected to the whole, like, how does Jim afford this party? Cause, like, yeah, I think Jim has some suspect connections. Yeah, because he, he's like, do you know who you're talking to? That makes me think, like, um, that makes me think, like, either he's well-connected or he's playing it up like he is. Mm. Um, and again, we, we still have, like, the box, we still have, like, the truckload full of condoms, which can either be, like, oh, he's just having an, having affairs all the time, so that's why he has those. Or maybe it's something more than that. Um, yeah, it's possible. So. <sighs> I'm I'm very I'm very thirsty for the answers to these mysteries. <laughs> right, I feel like we're unlike in season one where it felt like and once you reached episode like I guess the first one to be eliminated was Mark and then after that there was uh, I don't really remember the order but it felt Jack. like one yeah Jack people were eliminated week by week whereas with this one we haven't eliminated anybody definitively yet. Right. Um, especially as the, as the police room says, in your, in your wildest theories, there are three rapists. Um, and in your, in your best case scenario, there is just one serial rapist, Mm -hmm. which is a weird best case scenario. But so the next scene, we join Mark on his murder field trip and he finds Joe Miller at the docks at some kind of security job at Liverpool and... He's traveled to Liverpool in his Mark Latimer plumbing van. It's very inconspicuous. And as someone said, I loved this. Someone on Reddit said he might as well have been driving around a van that that said Joe Miller murder machine. (laughs) 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 Right? Yeah, no, I also noticed the, um, well, because for once, usually we watch it that Ken watches it first and then I watch it after. Mm -hmm. But... This time I watched it first, so because normally I'm the one who I, I tweet, I text you like a, a couple of reactions, yeah. and I really wanted to text you about the van. I'm like, why <laughs> would he drive his own plumbing van to a murder? But know. you know, I I couldn't because you hadn't seen it yet. Because Mark is so bad at this. He is not good at it. No. Or, I mean, it, it, it would be really. I think it would be like mis- It would be misleading. Um, given that Mark has given Paul every reason to believe this is a murder field trip. Like, but if, if Mark doesn't intend to kill Joe, then I think it's been very misleading. Mm. Um, so I think this is just a bad murder plan that um, either Mark, right, three ways, will fail to execute on, or he'll execute it, or he'll find he'll find some way to, like, um, like, you know what, maybe I'll just talk things out. Maybe this is the therapy I need is to like this guy that used to be like a best friend. Maybe I need to just, you know, talk things out with him since I kind of never gave him the chance to do that. So, I don't know. And and Beth leaves a voicemail, uh, which Mark deletes. So, I mean, if anything, Paul had the effect of like getting Beth to at least give saving Mark a try. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so th- this is really, so Ellie comes over to Alex's house, and for me at least, un- unless the show writers just wanted to throw me off the, the the trail here, I think Ellie came up with the low-key, like, the thing that ca- that might really truly connect the rapes, which is they're not, she, she says, oh, maybe there's not a geographical connection, it's a seasonal connection, since all the rapes happen right. during the summer months. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so that leads you to think it could be seasonal workers, uh, people who aren't here year round. But Alec doesn't really see the value in that observation because he's he's really too busy looking. I, I think at least looking at the people who are attending the party, who all lived in the area. Yeah. But. Yeah, he's he's. It feels like he's both operating on. The assumption that it is one person and also possibly not one person at the same time. Because mm-hmm. he's still definitely focused on that it was somebody at the party. But was somebody who was at this party necessarily involved in the other two things? We don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's right around then that Arthur Tamsworth from Axhampton calls. Uh, his dog, Pedro, has found a sock on the premises. And let's see. Ed violently assaults Jim at the garage and... All I can think is, oh boy, that's not good for the investigation either. Because no, next week, um, if I were Jim, I'm definitely reporting this. Unless, yeah. I, unless I have a reason not to report this. Like, I'm a drug criminal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a dude secretly doing stuff for money that no one knows about. Um, who knows, right? But I'm like, oh, Ed, you really did set yourself up there for an assault charge. Yeah, so there's that. And then we find Leo at some rando football match where the whole team is wearing the same exact sock, uh, the same type of sock that was found at Axhampton. Dun, dun, dun. And finally, dumbass Ian breaks into his own house. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you put it that way because, like, I'm like, I'm like, who is it? Who is it? I'm like, you know. I, like, turned the volume down because I was prepared for, like, a jump scare, and I'm just like, what's happening? And then, yeah, like you said, dumbass Ian breaks into his own house. Yeah, well, I don't know. If I flip back to last week's notes, I'm pretty sure I wrote that down somewhere. Yeah, like, he calls his daughter to try to convince her to give give her the laptop, and she's like, no, Dad, you think I'm dumb? I'm like, oh, great, (laughs) Ian's gonna go, he's gotta go, like, break into his own house at some point. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I, I, I might... I might try to um, go back to last week's episode to find out. Because <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's, that's exactly what's going to happen. Because Ian is a resourceless, like, loser. <laughs> <laughs> like, when he couldn't convince his own daughter to give him a laptop. And, and do, <laughs> doing it at night, too. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if... I mean, there's so many things we could open, on, open up on next week. But I wouldn't be surprised if one of them is, like, Ian getting smacked with, like, a frying pan. <laughs> As, as, as like, Leah or Trish wake up with an intruder in their house and they just take matters into their own hands. So. Yeah, and they, he would deserve it because he is dumb. Yeah. Yeah, dumb ass Ian. Oh, my God. Oh, God. This is, yeah, this is so good. And I, I kind of skipped over the, oh, like, Leo has the socks, which could be a connection. The, I mean, though, it's just as likely that... Maybe he's playing football with someone who have that sock. But yeah, I, mean, I think everything's kind of coming together. Like, we, we know what the murder weapon was. I think we have the sock now. Well, um, it wasn't a murder weapon because, you know, oh. they're alive. <laughs> the assault <laughs> uh, I'm a bad detective. That would, that would, get, me thrown, <laughs> that would get me thrown out. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I wrote down some theories and also some Reddit theories. Um so, immediately after the episode, I'm like, oh my god, I know, it's the musicians. Um, but I went back and checked the um, the episode script, right? Mm-hmm. And the musicians, or, or like the musician, didn't mention anything about playing anything but local pubs. Hmm. Okay. Um, so, I think that kind of x is the whole seasonal thing. Um, and catering... I mean, we met the guy who worked at catering, and, like, they're at a restaurant that happens to do catering. So they don't have any reason to be seasonal, except maybe people don't do catering. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm just not sold on the musicians or caterers, because we haven't spent nearly enough time. I feel like they would have to do it really, really well in order to still get kind of, like, that, oh, shit factor that we had in season one. Some other theories, right? Um, so I, I was trying to think, okay, well, who, who's been mentioned that could have any seasonal interests and, Mm -hmm. um, Leo's dad 
as a golf mm. enthusiast. Yeah. And absentee character um, who would be maybe perfect for for this. Like That's true. Since, since apparently he's successful enough to just leave like this dumb kid in charge of a fishing or like a string business. I don't know. Nets. So, I mean, not, not that that's particularly compelling. I think you, you make a good case for, like, um, the musicians and catering may, being narratively unfulfilling, and Leo's dad would be even worse because it's, this is a character we haven't met yet. And if he turned out to be connected to it, it could be disappointing. Um, there are some theories that Dave King, uh, Aaron's friend, might be a character we've already met, but... Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, um, someone on Reddit uh, put together a theory that it was Nige. <laughs> there. Now, Reddit did put together a theory that it was <laughs> Nige. And I was like, you know, I I don't know. I don't know. I, uh, the, the, yeah, the, 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 I think the evidence amounted to, like, he was really excited to play football. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, but. After after hearing that the uh, the actor is a very friendly person, apparently I'll uh, I'll not dunk on on Nige or the Nige theories. Except I don't really think um, I don't, none of the characters, uh, none of the townies in season one are suspects. They, I don't think so. They, I mean, they, people they, are people are really liking the Paul theory. People are liking, I guess, Nige, but I don't I don't know. Can we kill the Joe? Miller is the rapist theories since he's all the I way out really in fucking Liverpool. Hope so. Yeah, I really hope so. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will say, uh, it's funny since Joe Miller was probably in every episode in season one and season two, mm-hmm. but it still feels like the show has not been about him or right. that he's been, he's been absent for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because in my head, Joe Miller just becomes, I believe the actor's name is Corey Stroll. But he, he kind of becomes Peter Russo from House of Cards in my head. Ha! And the, the, they don't deserve that comparison. They're both just bald actors, but. Yeah, they don't really look anything alike. No, yeah, they're both bald. <laughs> they're bald white. <laughs> bald white. I like that character. I, yeah, I kind of gave up on House of Cards. Same. Same. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I think we talked about it. The first thing I asked you when you when you had finished the episode and I had it, I'm like, hey, what would you give this five out of five? And you said five. And I'm like, yeah, that, after coming out of that, I'm like, yeah, that's a, that's a five episode. Um, yeah, well, I think that there wasn't anything... It, there wasn't anything superfluous about like everything. It moved fast. Everything was mm-hmm. interesting. It grabbed me. It was yeah. There was I had no complaints. Yeah. the 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 one thing I will um, maybe sigh about, and maybe we'll get proven wrong next week. Um, but I think as you and I have talked about like uh, already, the fact that Ian is breaking into his own his own house, and to some extent, the fact that Ed has assaulted Jim. I feel like these are both things that could potentially derail or delay significant developments. Because now we're going to have to spend some time like, oh, Ian, what were you doing breaking into the house? What do you, you know, what's on this laptop? Oh, Ed, why did you, and those are all things that could reveal greater truths about, like, what's happening. And how does this all tie into the rape? Um, Mm-hmm. But I feel like we've got some distractions heading our way. Maybe the same way that Aaron has Aaron has revealed some new information to us. Uh, yeah, right. But I think has served his like red herring um, role for now. I think. But yeah. Uh, yeah. If you don't have any more thoughts, though, I think we'll just call that an episode of the Sea Brigade. Yeah. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I, again, as we close out every episode, would love to get some more emails, um, especially as we get into the final weeks. Like, this is your last chance to talk about Broadchurch until we do that, those other Broadchurch podcasts we've been talking about. But Yeah, so is, please. Yeah. You know. Is, and 
the more I think about it, the more, you know, after Fargo season three, um, I bet the f- broad church community will do some like retrospectives and season one rewatches when all this is all wrapped up. So mm-hmm. we'll, we'll probably slide in right there. But, yeah. And, uh, you know, what? I also been thinking, I, I always forget to thank, um, Kevin McLeod for the intro song, the silly, yes. beach, the silly beach music. <laughs> and all of our Arnolds for the uh, the the bummer <laughs> music, the super bummer music, which uh, you'll be hearing right now as we gleefully say, uh, "Thank you for listening to us, and we'll catch you next week." Yes. Bye. Bye.